Over the years, people have traveled to Calvin University and Calvin Theological Seminary in Grand Rapids, Michigan to worship and learn. This year, we travel virtually around the world to many different worshiping communities. We are living in a time of fear, upheaval, and so much death. Each community has been shaped by the COVID-19 pandemic in different ways. However, we know that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We cling to this promise, which will guide us for this online experience. Hi, I'm Jeremy Perigo, and it's a joy and delight to welcome you into our worship here in the B.J. Hahn Auditorium at Dort University in Sioux Center, Iowa. A couple times a week, our students lead us in praise and worship, and we come and hear God's word, and we intercede for our world. And tonight, we invite you to join with us as we pray and as we celebrate and as we bring our requests before our loving God. Join us as we worship. The king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song, cause you are the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song let the king
gonna let me down You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down I remember when we first sang this song, it was with my youngest daughter caught on to it really quickly. And as we were singing this song in my backyard, I was spinning her around and she was singing this chorus. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let me down. And for me, the very first time I heard that, I thought this was kind of a prosperity gospel song where you say like, everything's gonna be awesome. Everything is gonna be great. But as I was holding her and just spinning around in the backyard and she was singing that, the actual kind of embodied, the real theology of the song kind of hit me like, oh yeah, this is the God that like promises he would never leave us or forsake us. Our call to worship comes from the Psalm, Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me shall become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day for darkness is as light to you. This is the God who promises, maybe not that we get everything we want, and this year has been one of those years that has had a lot of unexpected things, but one thing that we can count on is that he promises that he will be with us. He promises that he's never gonna let us down. He'll never let us down. Let's sing that. You're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down tonight as we come to this time of worship and invite you in your bedroom in your office with your church family or with your friends, we wanna say that God is good. Sometimes we can't see that, but our covenant-making God is good. He's a God of relationship. And tonight we wanna celebrate this good, amazing God. So would you join with us as we sing this chorus that many of you have sang in, in many languages together. God is so good. Sing this together. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good. You're so good. Love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of Glory, the King of all Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of Glory, the King of all This is amazing grace. Who brings 
our chaos back into order. Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who's the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is our failing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done Who worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. Isaiah says to put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And tonight we all bring our challenges, our problems, our, our stresses. And we say, God, here they are. And we pray tonight you would take our mind and help us focus on who you are in the midst of what we have. In the midst of what's going on, we want to proclaim your goodness and your greatness. Put off all my heaviness and I put on this garment of praise. You turn my morning into dancing. You turn my night into day. I put off all my heaviness and I put on the garment of praise. Cause you turn my morning into dancing. And you turn my night into today I put on all my heaviness and I put on the garment of praise you turn my morning into dancing you turn my night into day I put on all my heaviness and I put on this garment God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your holy name, your kingdom come, your will be done in all the earth as in bring our prayers of intercession before the Father. So much has happened, Lord, in 2020 because of COVID-19. And so much hasn't been able to happen. The world has experienced so much pain and brokenness and loss. Dreams unfulfilled, careers devastated, bodies ravished by a new virus families torn apart because of the death of loved ones and not, e not even able to grieve fully. Those most vulnerable forced into really, really tough places. And communities torn apart because somehow it's just become so politicized. We cry out for mercy. Mercy, Jesus. Let heaven come. Let your kingdom come. Forgive us for our insular gaze and lack of participation in advancing your kingdom. Open our quarantined eyes to see your unquarantined presence still active in our lives and communities. Use us to bind up the brokenhearted. Use us to energize the emotionally and spiritually and physically fatigued. Use us to minister peace to the anxious and use us to bless and nourish others with your life-giving presence. Let heaven come. Sing this. Let heaven come. As your prayer, let heaven come. Let heaven come. Oh, Father, on top of this global pandemic, our nation faces a national pandemic of racism. And we find ourselves confronted with the realities of BLM, I can't breathe, say their names, which only scratch the surface of the sorrow you feel, Jesus. Would you break our hearts for what breaks yours? Break our hearts for what breaks yours. Break us out of the ways we have lived into a cultural narrative and fighting with slogans and strategies instead of on our knees embracing your kingdom of sacrificial love. 
and incomprehensible mercy. Forgive our complacency and reluctance to take action and engage in what's important to you. Deliver us from the evils that we don't even know we're participating in. Because you hate injustice, you stand against the proud and can't stand divisiveness, and yet you dwell with the humble and lowly of heart. And we as a nation have once again been brought low, laid bare, uncovered, where the ground is equal at the cross. And as you make us one at the foot of the cross, would you empower us afresh to lay down our lives for our image-bearing brothers and sisters who are still struggling to breathe. For yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, and yours is the glory. Pray these words, let heaven come. Let from, would you in your own heart language join with us in prayer as the Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins we forgive those who sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Colossians, listen, for this is the word of the Lord. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. 
For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Here, there's not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is all and in all. Your life, your life right now, is hidden with Christ in God. Your life right now is hidden with Christ in God. What a beautiful and mysterious place to be. As you hear in the prayer, our kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Paul pastorally um, encourages and exhorts his congregation already here in Colossa the same thing. Set your hearts on things above. Set your minds on things above. When Jesus promised it, that we would have power. And the last thing that he ever said with his followers, you will have power, you will receive this when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And then you'll be my witnesses. There is a great deal of confusion in the world today about what that power is really about. What we hear in the prayer of thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when Jesus tells his followers that you will be fishers of men, we begin to get the idea that what they are fishers of is not just of men, but of future realities collapsing into present possibilities. We are to imagine the fulfillment and the finalization of all of Jesus' promises and all of the ambitions that have always been inside the heart of God since the foundations of the world being brought into the present by his people. And then he equips us with an arsenal of possibilities that he goes on in this passage to name as things like humility, gentleness, Kindness. That the power that we would receive would be an ability to, to bring the future into the present by reflecting the character of God that we are hidden within into the realities of the relationships in the world around us where we currently exist. You are a possibility maker when your life is hidden with Christ. In God. And for all these possibilities, then Paul goes on in the passage to talk about the things we need to take off so we can enter into these possibilities. And then the last one that he names that you just heard read in Colossians 3.11 is that here, when God's people gather here in God's presence, here at the foot of the cross, we all collectively experience the greatest global common denominator. We are all leveled before the cross. And no amount of wealth or status or fame or rejection or despair or loss or pain changes that reality when we find ourselves here. For here those differences don't exist. Here, the future possibility of what will happen when we sit together at the wedding supper of the Lamb, where there be no flags flying of any nation that differentiates us based on our wealth, our possibilities, or our material and military might. They will not distinguish any, anything between us anymore. Here, there is no. Here, the prohibition from Paul. Here, there is no difference. You died. And your life, already now, is hidden with Christ in God. You 
see, what the New Testament authors are always trying to help them, these young Christians understand is that they now have the ability to see the world in a different light, to enter into conversations and, and difficulties with a different posture because the possibilities that exist for those who are in Christ are simply different. Even at the close of the canon, by the time we get to the last book of Scripture in Revelation, a people undergoing significant persecution, hardship, struggle, their pastor taken off, put on a prison island, they are reeling for fear of their own lives. The command more often repeated in that book than anything else, 40 times over, is look. Not fight. Not flee. Just look. Look with the possibilities. Look with eyes of faith and not eyes of fear. So here, when we gather as God's people, we go fishing into the future and bring the promised realities of Jesus' final fulfillment into the present. And there is strife between different peoples, and you hear it in this passage. Paul says, you got to get rid of this if you want to enter into, if you want to become like the character of Christ. If you want to become like him and his father. Here, there is no Greek, Jew, Gentile. Wasn't this the ultimate first century us and them differentiation? And we still do this today. Even as followers of Christ, we talk about the differences between different types of people. We are not the antidote yet to racism and division. When Sunday morning is still the most segregated hour in America and in many other places in the world, we are not there yet. The differences that Paul's railing against in this passage are still ones we are confronting. I came across a statistic recently that just still has my brain absolutely reeling. We keep being concerned about the differences that happen to the world as we know it when someone new comes into it. And yet the truth is, is that 90%, 90% of every refugee and immigrant that comes into this country within the first 10 years, either already is or will be a follower of Jesus. Now that is entering into a place where in the last most recent years, there's been four new non-believers for every one new believer here. Perhaps the greatest possibility of the propagation of the church, even in our own settings, is actually from the other. And the thing that we fear the most might be the thing that can save us the best. I am infinitely more concerned right now in this moment about the calloused borders around our hearts than I am about the porous walls around our nations. On the other side of our fears, or when a global biological pandemic ends, unfortunately, this still remains. And we need to work harder at opening our arms wider and the postures of our heart wider to the other. Or we will never be the witnesses that we are called to be. Part of that has to do with getting rid of the divisions inside of our own houses. In this passage, another thing that he lists off is not, there is no Jew or Gentile, there is no circumcised or uncircumcised. Their favorite religious difference of the day. How much energy is expended amongst the people of God arguing with one another still about religious differences? How fine will we parse out our doctrinal differences with one another rather than celebrating what we have in common in this place where we are level before the cross? You see, my guess is, is there will be no skill-testing question at the gates of heaven that has any sort of theological skill or knowledge to it. Aaron, before you can come home with me and take your place that has been prepared for you since the beginning of time to be with me, I just need to know, what were your thoughts about infra versus supralapsarianism? I don't think that's part of the deal. 
Is it possible that we argue and fight about these things and care more about them than Jesus himself ever will? One of the worst dangers of our sinfulness is the division that it creates. When sin entered into creation, it created a distancing between us and God, a distancing between us and each other, a distancing between us and creation, and a distancing between us and who we are supposed to be. Social distancing in the middle of a global biological pandemic is not nearly as dangerous as a heart distancing between us and God or us and one another. The differences listed in this text, barbarian, Scythian. Barbarian, this is a, a Greek automatopoeia word. They thought that everybody else who wasn't them talked funny because it wasn't their language. So they would refer to anybody else speaking in another tongue as them saying bar, 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 bar. And so the word comes in Greek as barbarian. They just sound funny. We are so capable of picking up the finest of differences between us and using those things to commodify some sort of variation between our worth. What a dangerous place to be. And they include Scythian because at the point in time, at this point in time in history, this is the furthest known people group across the continent of Asia that they were aware of. They would have referred to them as barbarians, savages. And God needs his people to know, to be reminded again and again that when we see someone who bears any sort of difference from us, the first thing that needs to be aroused within us is not a disdain, but a curiosity. A curiosity about the creativity of God and his fascination with all the nations. That 7.8 billion people could look all entirely different, and it's not a reason to make a difference between one person and another in a way that makes one worth less than another, but rather that we would only come to celebrate the creative diversity of our God even more. The very things that he created, the differences between us, that are supposed to be part of what drive us to awe and wonder about his creative, his creative genius instead, only because of sin, becomes the very points of division between us. But we were all bought at a price. Slave or free? Wouldn't it just be like the sinful worst part of man to take one person's life Make it worth less than another. And have them do things that we wouldn't do ourselves. Paul's calling out in this text the worst of what we can be. And instead telling us to go fishing with Christ into the future for what will be most definitively. When he brings it to finality. You see, we're all adopted as sons and daughters and bought with a price. And so the great level, the great leveling before the cross, the common denominator for all of us is that Christ is all. And if we're expending more energy or anxiety these days about anything other than that, then we, my friends, have missed the mark. Paul encourages us in this text as it starts out, and you heard in the reading, set your eyes on the prize. Set your hearts on things above. Set your minds on things above. Take your imagination captive and then expand it to the possibilities that all come in Christ Jesus. Because everything's coming under his lordship. And all of these need to be offered back. The story Jesus told well, this story we're told about Jesus in Mark chapter 12, where the Pharisees and Herodians come before him and try to test him. They want to create a division. They go, they, it's another us versus them question. Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? What do we give our government and what do we not? And notice it's the political and the religious leaders who come to him. Is it them or is it us? And what is Jesus' response? He asks for a coin and whose face is on it. 
And they tell him, Caesar's. So he says, well, then give to Caesar what is Caesar, but give to God what is God's. If Caesar wants to put his face on a coin, happily give it back to him. But of course, the implied inverse is also true. What did God put his image on? Each and every one of his children. And so the people of God, the new humanity on display for the world, who will go out each and every day and go reeling into the future to bring it back into the present and show the world what things could be when it all falls under the imagination of Jesus. So he's given us each a sliver and a piece of that to imagine and dream it together, to let heaven come, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And a big part of that starts with the way that we see and act and treat one another when we give those back to him. Will you pray with me? Father, we acknowledge that it's within our sin and because of it that we have ranked and classified people, that we look at some and see some people worth less financially, materially, because of where they live, where they came from, how they speak, the flavors and smells of their food or the sounds of their music. God, we have slapped you in the face when we have mocked your creative diversity and we repent. And we ask that we would become a truer reflection of who you would have us be. That we would look curiously, beautifully different for the world. Trying to live in future realities and making them present possibilities for those who don't experience that yet. Father, heal our hearts, heal our land, heal our nations. And Jesus, please. Start with us. Amen. Let's continue our prayers, our intercessions, as we pray along with our Savior from John 17 that they might be one.
Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Make us one, Lord. Make us one, Lord. Make us one.
Our morning, maybe turn to dancing. And if you've experienced hurt, may you also experience his healing. If you feel alone, may you be found bound together, the people of God. Go out into this new year and into this day under the full blessing of the one who's so madly in love with you. He created you to love you. He died because he loves you. He rose again because he loves you. He's coming again because he loves you. Go in peace.